to the stage Yahoo Finance's Editor-in-Chief Andy Serwer and Dan Roberts for a conversation with Brad Garlinghouse, CEO of Ripple. You guys are losing energy in the afternoon. I don't like that. I want to hear some, come on, some ups here, okay? Especially right. Sam Rowe. He's got all the energy in the world over there for the rest of the Yahoo Finance team. Let's have a hand to the Yahoo Finance team who's working really hard to put this all together. Thank you, guys. Thank you very right. much. Well, Take it away, Dan. Dan. Brad here today is the CEO of Ripple. This is a company that has surely been a lot in the news recently. And I have to say, just anecdotally, as we've gone through this day, seen a lot of great speakers, a lot of terrific panels, everyone keeps stopping me and asking, OK, when's Garlinghouse? When's Garlinghouse? So here he is. I hope I don't disappoint. You are not going to disappoint. So a few things about Brad. First of all, some background. First of all, he's from Kansas, which I just love that. Topeka, Kansas. Rock chalk. That's it. Kansas <laughs> strong right here. And the other thing is, another place he's from is he's from Yahoo. Now, I don't know if you all remember that, but I do. In fact, you've been in this building before, right? I have indeed, in many years ago. Previous but... incarnations. Yes. And one thing, I just want to get this out of the way before we get into Ripple, <laughs> because it's famous at Yahoo, maybe not famous for you all, but like there was a manifesto at Yahoo. We were talking about how we were doing business and this and that. People were doing business the right way and the wrong way. And Brad came out with what became known as the peanut butter manifesto. And it's, it's famous, actually, not only at Yahoo, but in all of Silicon Valley. Do you want to say what the peanut butter well, manifesto is? It's famous in the echo chamber of Silicon Valley, yes. I think. But, uh, <laughs> On the it, show. It, it, the premise was effectively that, uh, you know, like maybe many companies, Yahoo had increasingly spread itself quite thin. And the metaphor that had been used internally was, you know, we spread around our investment capital like peanut butter. And I thought that was a terrible idea, and we should really decide we needed to understand our true north of what we wanted to be the best in the world at. And it was really an, an argument that the, the idea of spreading around resources like peanut butter is a, the, a bad strategy. Right, you need to focus. I could go on like that for another 10 minutes, so I'll just stop right, there. Right, no, we stop there, because we do want to ask about uh, Ripple, and there's a lot of questions people have. So why don't you start off, Ann? Yeah, let's get right into that. I, I think in the simplest sense, for anyone in the room who, who doesn't know, Ripple handles international payments for banks and financial clients. Is that a fair way to? to distill it? Yeah, I would say we, we sell technology and solutions to banks and financial institutions to solve a payments problem around cross-border payments, a liquidity problem around cross-border payments. We've signed up about uh, over 100 banks, 100 financial institutions around the world, and, uh, and including one Chinese customer today. Yeah, just today, actually, Ripple announced some news. It, it might as well mention it here on stage. The fourth largest payment network in China, Leon Leon, if I'm saying that yep. close to correctly, uh, has joined Ripple and, and is going to use it. So when we read this in the news, and we were talking about this earlier with uh, Chain. We had the CEO of Chain up here. When we read headlines that another bank or another big client has signed on with Ripple, what does that really mean in practice? What it means is that someone has uh, signed up to use our technology to uh, enable cross-border payment flows. Uh, I think what the confusion that happens in the marketplace is that our core product, uh, kind of our flagship product, is called XCurrent. And XCurrent is solving the, the, really the messaging and settlement problem that exists in the financial system today. Uh, humorously, frankly, I point out to people that if the three of us decided we needed to get $10,000 or 10,000 pounds to London today, the fastest way for us to do that is to go buy a ticket, EWR or JFK, and fly it there. <laughs> and that's just, that's just a fact. Uh, obviously, that seems crazy in a world of the internet. I can stream video from the space station. So what Ripple's, that X current is enabling is real-time messaging, real-time settlement between banks. The confusion that I think people are like, well, wait a minute, how's XRP fit? XRP is used in our second product called XRapid. XRapid is solving a liquidity problem. So it's the messaging is, you know, I have an existing pool of capital between the bank of Andy and the bank of Dan. You're using a big bank, very successful bank. Bank of Dan is a good one, yeah. Bank of Dan. <laughs> Andy's bank, a lot of compliance what? issues. Oh. But the, the, these two banks are using XCurrent to settle fiat, a key point here. What happens, though, is you decide you want to settle with the bank of Brad. The Bank of Brad is in Argentina, and we're using pesos. You don't want to pre-fund pesos in my, my bank. Now, part of that is because that requires an outlay of capital, and that's dormant capital. Part of that is because you now have a compliance check that you're doing annually and quarterly. There's, there's cost associated with that. And if it's the Argentinian peso, you have an inflation problem. 
So you put 100,000 US dollars worth of, or probably 100 million dollars worth of US dollars there that is now going to be worth, worth less over time. What XRAPID allows you to do is to have real-time liquidity. The Bank of Andy can sell a dollar, buy XRP, that XRP can then be moved to an Argentinian digital asset exchange. You can sell the XRP and buy an Argentinian peso, and now you have good liquid funds in less than 10 seconds in another market. Now I want to make sure that we define our terms forever in terms of XRP, the token of XRAPID, Ripple, the company. I think there's some confusion there. Uh, you know, very often when we hear financial institutions talk about blockchain, they talk about using blockchain but without any cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency, they sort of, eh, I don't want to have to deal with that, but I like blockchain. And so in this example you've just brought up, in fact, let's say the Bank of Andy says, okay, I like the idea of the international payment going faster, less friction, but I don't really know about XRP, I don't want to use that. Can that be, I mean, that's a, a back-end settlement token, really. We, we, that, is, that is how we engage customers. They, you know, there is a, clearly there's a lot of misunderstanding about digital assets, and I think some of it's been you know clarified in the, the, the panels today. But what is interesting, and a, a quick anecdote, uh, even before Andy and I had met, I was a CEO of a voice over IP company. I was a telco guy way, way, way back when, pre-Yahoo, and actually I came into Yahoo. Yahoo bought a company called Dialpad. I sat down with the CEO, oh, sorry, at the time he was a very senior guy at SBC Communications. His name's Randall Stevenson. I've heard of him. He's now the CEO of AT&T. Mm -hmm. Randall Stevens said to me in 2000, AT&T, well at the time SBC, will never use IP for voice traffic. <laughs> now his point was, look, the, you know, we have a, a robust analog switch network that works for voice brilliantly. We'll invest in data, we'll invest in IP data, we'll have a separate network for that, and that's how it evolved. Well today, there is no voice network at AT&T, it's all IP. I think the exact same thing is going to happen in the banking world. I talk to senior banks, people who are close to the company Ripple, and they're invested in us, and they, they're like, hey, look, we love what you're doing around XCurrent. Not sure yet of XRapid. That's fine. It's Randall Stevenson. Like, I'm having an echo chamber. The XRapid product gives you a faster product at a lower price. Do we really not think that people are going to say, huh, that's kind of interesting? So over time, I, I view this absolutely as a crawl, walk, run. We're now working with over 100 banks around XCurrent. We've announced four customers using XRapid. Those are MoneyGram, uh, Merc Mercury FX, IDT, and Qualix, all payment providers. And they're using our first uh, testing transactions, but live transactions, moving many transactions, going into Mexico. And I think it's just the beginning. So I, I don't know what it is about Ripple, but there's something about it that makes people excited or freaked out or both or a little of everything. I mean. And, you know, in 2017, the price of XRP was up, what, 32,000 percent. And, you know, there are reports that said that that made you and other executives there billionaires, Brad. And is that right? Is that normal? Did that blow your mind? I mean, is it true? What, what, what's the bottom line there? Maybe we have a chart, we have a chart oh, yeah, of that? yeah, we have a price chart of XRP that right. we can pull up. We can pull it up. You know, I'll tell you the exact same thing I tell people inside the company. Woo! Look at that. <laughs> when I say inside the company, it's the exact same thing I would say outside the company. The price of XRP over three hours, over three days, over three weeks, or even three months, that is not success. That's not how I measure success. I think about success over the next three to five years. The, the, the problem we talk about these pre-funded accounts, the liquidity that the Bank of Andy wants to park at other banks, there's over $20 trillion parked in pre-funded accounts around the world. This is dormant capital. We're solving a problem measured in the trillions of dollars. And if we, can, if we can activate that asset, if we can make global commerce more efficient, there's an opportunity to drive a lot of velocity, a lot of demand, and a lot of volume across XRP. We are just at the starting line. I also said, you know, look, I think we've taken the first few steps of a marathon. But what I can also say is we've crossed the starting line of that marathon, and really no other companies in this space have. I think a lot of what you see happening in the space, there's science experiments, there's tests. We have production customers moving real money, both with XRapid, with XRP, as well as with our kind of fiat to fiat. There was an interesting graphic that I saw on Twitter recently. I think Ripple tweeted it out. And it basically showed the Bitcoin blockchain which at times, due to transaction volume, has sort of slowed or become weighed down. It showed Litecoin, 
which forked from the Bitcoin blockchain and is supposed to be a little faster. And then it showed one of Ripple's products. It must have been XRapid. And it was a moving GIF, pretty, pretty um, convincing GIF. And it was, whoo, it was just flying. Is there a way in which there's sort of a level of education required where you have to first explain, here's blockchain and here's traditional, here's cryptocurrency, here's Bitcoin, here's how that works as a payment network? as a payment platform. Now come along these other innovations, and now here is why XRapid is faster. And, and do you often get told, I mean, well, how can we prove that? Yeah. It, it, look, there is a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of FUD. There's a lot of passion around all digital assets. That's true of XRP. That's true of Bitcoin, for sure. I, I actually am long Bitcoin, personally. Uh, so I, I am not a believer that Bitcoin you know, dies some terrible death. I don't think it's going to solve a payments problem. Hmm. XRP is a thousand times faster and a thousand times cheaper than a Bitcoin transaction. Now, how do you how do you know that? I mean, how can you? I mean, that, those are charts. I mean, he's referencing some of this data. You know, earlier today. Well, actually, I don't know what was presented earlier today, but you know, the, the uh, CoinDesk published report of you know transaction state of the times. Report, yeah. yeah, state of the blockchain report. Thank you. You know, that shows you here is the average. Bitcoin blockchain transaction time in Q4, uh, average cost. Yeah, the fee is very high. The fee, I mean, you know, I make the joke that are you going to use a, a Bitcoin or a fraction of Bitcoin to buy a cup of coffee? Well, it's going to take hours to complete the transaction. Your coffee is going to get cold. Let's keep it on XRP for a second. <laughs> Let's keep it on XRP. We've been pushing a lot of people today on, on this topic. This certainly didn't only happen with XRP. But the idea that at the end of 2017, especially in December, we saw a frenzy of investment in cryptocurrencies, often from people who didn't necessarily do any real homework on these cryptocurrencies. Uh, you know, often on, on our live shows, I spend time talking about the different tech behind each coin. And my colleague, Miles Edlund, I think very correctly often says, well, these people don't care. They don't care about the tech that's behind them. They just want to buy the coins and watch them go up. And especially with XRP, Ripple, as we showed that chart, it just spiked so high. Is it concerning to you, alarming, or unsurprising to know that, obviously, at the end of the year, so many people were going to websites where they could buy up Ripple. They don't know anything about Ripple. Well, buy up XRP. Mm -hmm. I mean, an important distinction that we try to make repeatedly is you can't really, you, uh, well, you can buy shares in Ripple, the company, on the secondary market, but what people are buying is XRP. Right. Look, th the way I think about this, we are in the earliest innings. Uh, the markets are in an adolescent stage. There is a tremendous amount of volatility. I think it's going to continue. Hmm. I don't think it's going to stop anytime soon. But I also think even events like this, uh, the events in Washington, D.C. yesterday, the industry needs to go through a maturation process. Part of that maturation process is not pretending that we're going to live outside of the regulated financial markets. The, the, you know, one of the things that has made, to Andy's point earlier, that has made it ripple a little bit con contrarian and controversial is early on we were contrarian in that we said, look, we don't think governments are going away. The, right. the, the, the Bitcoin community, you know, some in the Bitcoin community come up with a very anarchistic libertarian view of like down with government, down with banks, and even down with fiat currency. Look, the U.S. dollar, I mean, we can talk about other currencies around the world, but the U.S. dollar works pretty well. I don't think the U.S. dollar is going away in my lifetime. I don't think the U.S. government is going away in my lifetime. The revolution that is enabled by blockchain technologies is not going to happen from outside the system. It's going to happen from within the system. And I, the, the thing that I think actually is a disservice to the, the, to the revolution is to pretend that we can live outside of a regulatory framework. You know, Ripple has from the earliest days invested in engaging regulators. And it, you know, when we go to Washington, D.C., we go to other regulatory bodies around the world and explain we aren't circumventing a KYC check, a, a know your customer check. We aren't circumventing an AML, anti-money liner check. We aren't circumventing BSA. Oh, there are lots of three-letter acronyms. I'll stop there. <laughs> but look, the Bank of England is a paid customer of Ripple's. There's another central bank we haven't announced that we're working with very actively. Like, the, we will continue to work with central banks. We'll continue to work with regulators and educating them about how we can accelerate the financial ecosystem, which is good on many, many, many levels and not in some way circumvent and enable anonymous transactions that obviously the government has concerns about. But can you reach a point with fiat currency where you're in a stable relationship and not actually eroding and undermining it? Well, I don't think XRP is eroding and undermining. I mean, I mean how is it complementary in a, in a sort of a, in a stable way? And not a threat, right. Well, I mean, 
the, the solution I described earlier with XRP, US dollar domestically is a great solution. Yeah. You're selling that US dollar, you're buying XRP, you're moving your XRP over to another digital asset exchange, you're selling the XRP, you're buying an Argentinian peso, just to use that example. I mean, I'm even careful, and I would even encourage journalists of the world to be careful, that I don't call this cryptocurrency. It's not currency. I can't go to Starbucks or Amazon and use, and then, you know, somebody inevitably like, well, I, I, you know, I have one example where I bought something with a Bitcoin, and then I usually say, well, did you do a second transaction? <laughs> like, it's not actually a currency. These are digital assets. If the asset solves a real problem for a real customer, then there will be value in the asset. If the asset is, as and frankly, I think many of the explosion of tokens don't have a real purpose. I, I was early last summer, I was very active in saying, look, I think these ICOs are a very bad thing for the industry. There, there are exceptions right. that I would say, okay, that ICO, there's a real utility to that token, there's a real purpose. But look, a lot of these things I look at and I'm like, this is not gonna end well. And then I think the comparisons people make to the dot-com bubble, I moved to Silicon Valley in 1997, I lived through that. There are some fair comparisons, but you also have to remember that Amazon was born in that era. You also have to remember that Google was born in that era. There are companies that are gonna grow out of this crazy evolution, this crazy revolution, that are going to be very valuable. But there's also gonna be some carnage along the way. Right, absolutely. Uh, when we talk about banks' interest in blockchain, and, and we hit this a little bit with the guys from Chain and blockchain, for a while, and maybe it's finally changing as people become more educated and they do more research, but for a while there was a very popular narrative of, we want blockchain without Bitcoin, without crypto. You guys, in a way, sit in the middle because you are a form of blockchain tech working with banks, but you do have a token. And sure. by the way, on, on the side note, I, I agree about cryptocurrency. I say no one's using it to buy things, call it digital no. assets, call it digital tokens. But in a way, you are sort of squarely in the middle of this where it is blockchain with an asset, but it's not an asset that the people using our technology really need to know about. I mean, it can sort of, it's the argument that it works behind the scenes. Yeah, I, well, or it works behind the scenes, or you can use Ripple's technology to better coordinate your existing pools of liquidity. Mm -hmm. Eventually, I'm working with the Bank of Andy, and he's like, hey, this is great, this is working great, I love what I'm doing, but I wanna be able to settle into the Philippine peso. And I say, well, do you have a correspondent banking relationship into the Philippines? And you say, well, no, I don't. And so your option is to spend months negotiating, literally six to nine months is the average time to establish a new bilateral relationship. There's something called a nostro vostro relationship. Andy parks dollars there, or parks pesos there, and the bank parks dollars in your account, I'm saying your dollars. You know, there's a better way to do this. And I think as banks increasingly understand we're not changing the regulatory dynamics, we're not changing this, and they see it's faster and it's cheaper, I'm optimistic. You talked about the Argentina and the Philippines sort of metaphorically. One place my understanding is where you are active, though, is Japan. And, yes. And, and why is that? And what does the Japanese market hold that's distinctive that gives you an advantage there? Yeah, Ripple, big in Japan. Yeah, <laughs> and Kansas. I don't know about Kansas yet, but well. <laughs> so uh, Japan is a unique market. Uh, so we, we entered into a joint venture with a large financial services player over there called SBI. And there's an entity called SBI Ripple Asia, and they serve the Japanese market. When we approach banks in Asia, we approach them to solve a cross-border problem that we've discussed here. What's super interesting mm -hmm. is that the local rails in Japan are not very efficient. So the reason why we don't really talk about domestic settlement for using Ripple's technology is like, look, AC, we can complain about ACH, and there's problems with ACH. It's pretty good. It's, it's, I mean, Ripple could do it better, but you know, we'll leave that <laughs> aside. It'd be a hard sales pitch to walk into the Bank of Andy and say, rip out your ACH rail and use Ripple. Mm -hmm. He'd kind of be like, look, that's not a big problem. That's not a big friction point. But if I go in and say to him, hey, your cross-border transactions, you're like, oh, that's a high friction point. My customers are frustrated that there's no transparency in the transaction. Uh, there's a lot of reasons to adopt Ripple. What happened, which we didn't really expect in Japan, is because the Japanese local rail isn't particularly efficient, we had all these banks talking to us about cross-border, they're like, well, wait a minute, can't we use this domestically? Right. Yeah, you can, can use it domestically. within Japan. Correct, and so we have, I think now, 63 banks that have signed up in Japan. It covers 40% of all accounts in Japan. Uh, they're in the process of going live uh, within Japan. What percentage of your business right now are these Japanese banks? Or, or at least the uh, relationships honestly, in Japan. 
Well, in terms of the number of banks, it's over 50% of it. I mean, we publicly announced we work with over 100 financial institutions around the world. I mean, I just, I think, said I, we're, I think it's 63 in Japan. So, you know, it's a big percentage. Wow. Uh, you know, lots of ways to measure business, revenue, volume, all these kinds of things. So it uh, depends how you, like everything, depends how you cut the data. When so why, look, is it, why is it like that there? And are there other countries that have that sort of same problem slash opportunity? Yes, uh, you know, back to the peanut butter manifesto, life yes. is about focus. <laughs> Ripple is focused on a cross-border settlement problem, mm. cross-border liquidity. The reason why our first corridor is into the Mexican peso is because the local rails in Mexico are extremely efficient. There's a local efficient. rail, very efficient, more efficient than ACH. The okay. local rail in Mexico called SPE, you can get from one regulated financial institution to another regulated financial institution inside Mexico in under an hour. So that means if I light up one regulated financial institution in Mexico, I can enable payments into any account in Mexico within an hour. It's pretty cool. Okay, so within it needs to be efficient, but it's point, the external part's got to be inefficient. Correct. I mean, cross-border, right. like the, 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 the lowest common denominator for cross-border transactions is enabled through SWIFT. It's enabled through this correspondent banking network. Yeah. And there are a very small number of banks who dominate that, and they, they extract billions of dollars of profit from the rest of the banks. They sit on the top. You know, when you ask, why is Jamie Dimon, you know, saying things about, uh, I mean, Jamie Dimon, well, actually, Citi is kind of number one, HSBC is probably number two, but JPM is way up there at the top, and they're making a lot of money from other banks. When we go talk to banks, 99.9% .9 of banks, they're like, we want Ripple to be successful. Because I'm sick of paying these guys, and you know, they're taking a lot of money from me that I then have to take from my customer. And why do I want to feed City to be more competitive with me in this local market? Or at the very least, they've heard that blockchain is hot, and they need to be doing something in blockchain. <laughs> There's some truth to that, too. Yeah. Um, I want to make sure we hit this. You, know, you were talking earlier about the FUD and some misunderstandings about XRP, and, and I appreciate that we're sort of addressing that. One question I, I want to raise, and just see if there's an updated take on. You got into it on Twitter with a reporter. We were talking about uh, whether the banks that have been announced as being partners of Ripple are really using Ripple. And there was just kind of a, an interesting exchange. I, you know, you kind of jumped on there on Twitter. That got a lot of attention. Any, any thinking there or? Look, uh, I'm, I'm gonna choose my words a little bit carefully. <laughs> I think particularly in today's political climate, real facts are really important. And it, when I believe people are uh, not are, are manipulating at the margin information, I think that is it's it's just bad for journalism. Do you think that in general, the cryptocurrency space has had, you know, a lot of problems in the media? I mean, I think I know the answer, but there's just so much misinformation out there. And you know, there's you have a, a, a website like CoinDesk, which we're partnering with today. You know, they are a trade publication. They they cover a lot of this stuff sort of expertly. We cover a lot of crypto, but then. I noticed in the explosion of December, you know, you've now got a lot of websites that some, some editor is telling people, hey, cover Bitcoin, and it's, and it's tough to get everything right. It's, look, this is an adolescent stage of this industry. It's incredibly important to me for the success of Ripple, but for the whole ecosystem, for the whole industry to mature. And I think that applies to the media coverage. Uh, and, you know, it's really frustrating when you go out and you read people who haven't really scratch the surface to understand the facts. And look, I think I don't view other blockchain companies as competitors because a lot of them are going after completely different use cases. Mm -hmm. We like the early days of the internet, you know, Yahoo was not competing with Amazon. They were totally different things. They, the internet needed yeah. to grow up. Right. Well, yeah, right. Well, yeah. Right. fast forward to 20 years later. But my, my point is I want all boats to rise. I think an important element of the, the maturation of this industry is also the maturation of the coverage of, uh, I mean, all aspects. Are, are you concerned, Brad, about, I mean, sort of taking a step back on government cracking down on and regulating more um, crypto in, in all sorts of ways? I mean, in India, South Korea, even Japan, um, credit card companies, Facebook. Yeah. Um, does all that, is that all going to, I mean, is that a, the sign of a maturing business or the sign of a backlash? I think it's a maturing business. I, you know, again, I'll go back to, I do think for me this feels a lot like 1996, 97 and the birth of the internet. And because I was a young whippersnapper doing stuff in Silicon Valley at the time, you know, 
the earliest days of the internet, governments were like, whoa, wait a minute, what does this mean? And there was lots of kind of whipsawing back and forth about what regulators are doing. I actually think most of what you see happening is regulators be behaving as they should. They're trying to make sure that, hey, we have regulations around know your customer. There's, there are reasons for that. And so if exchanges are trying to circumvent KYC requirements, they should, they should come and enforce that. Uh, my only concern I would have, and back to the maturation, is that people understand the differences. I mean, one of the things that I think has been interesting in this recent downturn, the kind of sell-off that's happened, is for the most part, the whole, the whole category has moved at about the same decrease. Like the whole category went down you know, 30% over a few days. That's interesting, right? Like there are some tokens whose express purpose is to enable anonymous transactions. And so the regulators are saying, whoa, 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 we, you know, we're not okay with that. I, by the way, I think they should say that. Uh, but why does the whole market react that way? I don't, that doesn't actually, that to me is to not a rational market. There are tokens being used in regulated sections. I mean, I'm thinking of XRP in this case, but uh, you know, where I think, I'm gonna take the long view. I think there's gonna be a lot of volatility. Uh, I think what we're building has, you know, it's solving a real problem. And I think all of the tokens, my advice to anybody would be, understand the utility. If there's real utility and there's real value being delivered to a real customer, there will be value in the token. Otherwise, I think, you know, be careful. When we talk about the market sort of rising and falling together, and I, I do agree, usually it's either all coins are up or all are down, but I think in the last month or so, we've seen at least a little bit of a differentiation some days. Some days Ethereum is up, a Bitcoin is down, and maybe that's encouraging and people are doing more homework. But let's do, let's do a hypothetical. Uh, we asked you about XRP at the beginning. You said, you know, I don't, I don't define Ripple's success based on the price of XRP. Let's in say that- In the short that, term. Okay. I said that in the short term. Look, there, to be very clear, Ripple owns 61.x percent of all XRP. That's what I was going to ask you about. I want a very successful XRP ecosystem. The way I measure the success of that ecosystem is around volume, velocity. <clears throat> uh, you know, the, the, the success of any asset is going to be dictated by its usage, by its demand. You know, I, my point was simply, I think my point earlier was, I don't think about this, and I try not to check the price of XRP you know, multiple times a day. Sure, I probably check it once a day, but look, it's gonna go up, it's gonna go down. What I care about is if we are delivering for our customers, there's going to be increasing opportunities to use things like XRapid to solve a multi-trillion dollar liquidity problem. That's an exciting thing to go out and solve, and frankly, for the employees at Ripple, I think there's a mission-driven we want to ha put our dent in the universe and really enable an internet of value, to truly let value move the way information moves today. And that is possible, and it has a lot of effects that I think are hard to predict in the same way the internet of information in 1997, could we have predicted I could walk outside and get a car on demand or a, you know, anything on demand, <laughs> whatever it is. Do you think that XRP right now is behaving based on Ripple the business? Like, hypothetically, it should rise or fall based on as Ripple signs more banking partners. Well, but of course, but of course I, I mean, there's a market yeah, completely I mean, a separate of, of everything. There's yeah. a lot of speculation. I think that as we've talked already, there's a lot of correct information, there's a lot of misinformation. I, I just, uh, you know, I try not to think about the price of XRP. I, I certainly don't comment on the price of XRP. I, I will again point out Ripple, the company, as an owner of 61% of the tokens today, is the most interested party in the success of the XRP ecosystem. And we will do things to invest in the success of the XRP ecosystem because that's in our best interest. I wanted to get a question from the audience from uh, Twitter from Alexander Daly. Um, Brad, do you see Ripple in working with financial institutions in the same line of work as Chain? I guess they mean the company chain. Or any other and, company and, right. you know, building right. private blockchains for right. banking and financial yeah. institutions. Well, look, I, I have a lot of respect for Adam, who I know was up here earlier. Yeah. My impression is that uh, Chain has shifted their focus to a product they called Sequence, which is, I think, more of a uh, kind of a, I don't think about them as a competitor in what we are doing. I know they, they did a, a pilot with uh, NASDAQ. They did a, some stuff with Visa. My impression is that they are you know, working on kind of a, a new segment of that customer set. So, uh, you know, in the cross-border payment space, 
I think Ripple is far ahead of what anybody else is doing, uh, and you know I, I, I feel good about the kind of traction, momentum, and the, the pipeline of customers that we, uh, we we have going. So, are you a blockchain company? Are you a crypto company? Mm -hmm. Both, neither. Well, the what first, are you? The first is what we're a payments you? company. Yeah. Okay. So you're I not. Mean, you know, I'll go back. I, I, okay. People are make fun of me. I'm gonna keep going back to 1997. I feel old. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, we used to talk about these companies. They're internet companies. Is Yahoo an internet company? No, Yahoo's a media company. Well, I, I think I mean, right. the Peter Butter Manifesto debated that. But hmm. the, the, the point is, I think of Ripple as a payments company that uses blockchain and digital assets to solve a problem for payments. The, one of the challenges, I think, if, there's a lot of companies and platforms out there that I think have a peanut butter problem. They're trying to be all things to all people. <laughs> if you have a hundred different use cases you're pursuing, you have zero. Because you cannot understand a hundred different customers and a hundred different needs of the buyer, and you need to focus and understand, hey, we're gonna solve for this vertical, and we're gonna use blockchain technologies to do that. So I'm, I, I'm a payments company that uses blockchain and uses digital assets to solve a payments and liquidity problem. All right, let's let him have the last word That's with what that. It is. And uh, I know a lot of people wanted to hear what you had to say today, Brad, so thank you very much for coming here. Brad Garlinghouse, CEO of Ripple, please join me in thanking him. Thanks, guys. Great stuff. Please welcome Yahoo Finance's Jen Rogers for a conversation.